Hey folks, Michael here. I appreciate you all joining me on Friday for uh, for the webinar where Dan and myself were talking on uh, how to cold email uh, in 2022, right? Um, the reason I'm recording this video is we accidentally didn't record the, the webinar even though um, we planned to. But as usual, uh, there was something off and the the recording um wasn't wasn't on so long story short um i'm recording this video basically guys to uh go through the webinar with you one more time and um as an additional bonus for you watching this i will be more in detail about all the things that we've spoke on friday okay so basically you will have the same content and we discuss on friday plus i'm going to add some things for myself because um you know i have your attention now so maybe there are some things that um we didn't go in in full detail on friday so now i'm going to take my time and actually going to go in depth and give you more actionable insights all right so let's just get started okay so obviously um um, I was joined by um, one of our sales executives, Dan. Uh, we've spoke about um, my experience running Belkins agency. Uh, Dan uh, shared his experience um, working in sales for Falderly and working with clients and and establishing new relationships and sort of like um, ex sharing expertise and, and knowledge of the email livability that he is doing with with current clients. Um, so we're not going to be going over that. I really wanted to focus more of your time on things that you can utilize on a day-to-day -day basis when you're dealing with with a lot of email, um, email outreach and email marketing. Okay. Uh, so the question that we wanted to answer on Friday was, should should I call email in 2022? Right? Does it work? Does it still work? And the, the, the answer was yes, it definitely works. And there are a few things to support this point, right? So the first is just look at the numbers of email marketing game um, um, that we've collected. So there are over 4 billion daily users um, for email. And this number is going to be increasing to 4.6 billion by 2025, right? There are almost 300 billion emails are sent and received on a daily basis. Can you imagine this number? 300 billion emails, right? Um, obviously, a lot of those emails are in a up in the spam folder, which is roughly probably 100 million, right? And 87% uh, of B2B marketers, according to Content Marketing Institute uh, of the 2020 study, say that email is one of their top three organic distribution channels, okay? And obviously, email has a great ROI and um, there are a lot of, you know, a lot of companies that are fans of emails and to be honest with you, I think that the reason why I am in the emailing game and generally why I feel that email is one of the channels that really works is the following. Um, so uh, basically, and by the way, I apologize for the typo here, uh, but the point is that there are other channels that really matter, right? And as a digital marketer, you always invest into um, a variety of different channels to create uh, maximum exposure, to build brand and to generate you know leads overall through multi-channel approach right the problems with other channels is that every channel obviously have their own unique things that you need to pay to pay attention to to be successful for example like um when we think of the advertising as one of the channels that mo most people go to when they start their business or when they start generating their first initial leads right uh advertising is very expensive to begin with you always need to have an advertising budget the conversions are low and especially right now because of the competition and because a lot of companies are or have been doing a lot of ads uh, and optimizing their uh, Google AdWords, Facebook AdWords, and so, so on and so forth, the cost of click or even cost of view is very expensive. Uh, I think that m my team had reported that the cost of click is probably a few hundred dollars right now for our business, even though we are dealing with 
a huge amount of different businesses and different industries, right? So the point here is that because the advertising is very expensive and because you, for you to generate results, you need to add more and more budget into, um, into the fire, right? Because overall, like if you are out of the budget and you don't pay for clicks, which Google automatically charge you, right? Then at the end of the day, um, you don't have leads, right? So it's not like a, an organic channel that you build up the traction for, right? Then it comes the the, the second on the, on the second place it comes this uh, SEO and content strategy, right? The problem with this too is that it takes one to two years to actually drive sufficient results to get benefit from this channel. Essentially, like you've invest substantial money upfront to build up the traction where. Um, which is something that I do and something that I'm very passionate about. And I encourage everyone to invest into your content and SEO, right? But as soon as you start working on your long term, right, you obviously need to uh, to cover your short term base, right? And for you to have to deliver uh, or to get some short term results, you need to, you know, to look up for this fast channel that produces fast results, right? And again, advertising is that channel, but it, it is expensive, right? Then you can also do LinkedIn, right? The problem with LinkedIn these days is that LinkedIn start being very aggressive towards any type of automation. So, and then they also are cutting down their limits uh, in terms of how many uh, LinkedIn uh, connection requests you send or how many messages you send. And this is a huge problem because right now when you're in the outbound game, generally really kind of being proactive into, you know, reaching out to people and promoting your product or service. When you do this through LinkedIn and your the number of, uh, let's say, new connections that you can send per week is, let's say, 50, right? An average conversion between a new connection request into accepted connection is, let's say, about 10% or 15%, then you are growing your network by 5 to 10 people every week. So you're growing your network by like 30, 40 people every month which and then if out of those 30 40 people you cannot use more so you need to have more linkedin accounts but would you have like a farm of net linkedin accounts that you use for the album no so essentially then from out of those linkedin connections the 30 40 that you grew maybe let's say 20 percent can reply to your messages and so these are additional five to six responses so essentially you cannot produce volume and because the conversions are so low because of the noise that is on LinkedIn and the competition, right? You cannot produce the, the enough conversions for your business. So essential LinkedIn is not going to be a very viable channel for you to begin with when you're starting out or when you um, just happen not to have enough, you know, enough uh, digital footprints or enough uh, presence on, on LinkedIn as a platform, right? Then, um, Obviously, cold calling comes into play, right? The problem with cold calling is that many people currently work from homes. So when not before COVID, right, you can, you know, go through gatekeepers and people are answering phones. So right now, many people work from home. Many people are not relying for, for calls uh, and people hate being disturbed, right? Like when the time is not right. So, and, and then obviously for you to have calling, the reason or what my problem with calling is right is um when you're speaking with customer on the phone right you need to be very very sophisticated with your offering and with your pitch right so you cannot just know uh you know product on a on a high level you really need to know in detail uh your customer base uh your references your successes uh, your integrations you know your product your processes your contract tracing all of these things right so for you to learn all that the ramp up time might, might take three six months and um and right now buyers right they are more research driven so they really take time they research your company they research your product they see your case studies so you cannot you know you cannot get an emotional sale so in a way when you're calling them you're disrupting their workflow then you're pitching something and even if you're a good seller and you know your product and you've been with the business for a while um you know you cannot get enough conversion so you're spending your time answering or talking to people or even not talking to people just dialing numbers right and and then 
that would be okay if companies didn't try to outsource this, right? So they are trying to build out these outsource centers where they, um, where they hire outsiders to generate leads or do cold calling on their behalf. And the problem with that, going back to my first point, was that those people are not enough sophisticated. So then they're representing your company in not in the best manner, which again, ruin the brand, but not just the brand generally not producing enough results or making people pissed off about you and so on and so forth, right? So then what's the, you know, what's the the, the exit strategy for, for this approach, right? I mean, you probably can do calling, but as the third or fourth touch point in the process, so it essentially you first you know, generate content, right? Then you generate the retargeting, advertising, going back people to the website, then you do some emailing, then LinkedIn, then only when people reply and you want to follow up with them, you follow up with them on through some digital channels, they don't reply to your emails or messages, then you go and you call. And in this way, you can maximize your conversion, you can do some calling, but not as the initial top of the funnel, but really somewhere down the funnel where they already not just leads, but maybe marketing qualified leads or, or sales qualified leads, right? But I think you, you get the point, right? And then the last channel we all know are the trade shows and venues that we all been visiting before COVID, right? But then the problem right now is that the number of those conferences uh, was cut down, right? People used not to go to those venues, right? People used not to meet uh, in person, even though we won't do that, but our habits are different. And the ROI from those trade shows are uh, lower and the numbers are never lower. And then, um, you know, obviously that shouldn't be our main focus overall, right? So in a way, that's where email comes into play, right? So obviously email as the the sort of like the the process or the channel is not um you know is not the the best um email is not the let's put that in this way uh for you to be very successful with email game you need to to know a lot of things right a lot of like small details a lot of things a lot of tricks up your sleeve because it's very it's very uh, easy to make a mistake. And when you make a mistake, email, uh, you know, or email reputation uh, wouldn't give you the second chance or third chance. So you would really need them to spend a lot of time and efforts to fix in that, right? So that's why um, it is very, very fish or email is the very good channel for you guys to generate leads from. However, you need to know the drill or know the, the ups and downs of this channel to actually navigate the waters, all right? So obviously today I'm going to talk more about what are those nuances are, okay? Looking at the screen right now, we, we Dan and myself, we're, we put a few um, conversions here to kind of help you to, you know, to understand better what expectations you might get from, from the email game, okay? So essentially uh, what you see here is, uh, you know, typically you're looking at about um, a thousand emails or a thousand leads that, that let's say you send, right? Typical conversion into from email to reply is about 10%. So you, you should generate about 100 replies. Out of those 100 replies, about 60%, right? Gonna be like negative people that would be interested say no, but then about 15% would be positive. And then there will be obviously some percents like 15 to 20% that would be um, you know, people that are on the fence, people that are on the out of the office, contact later, and so on and so forth, uh, or internal forwards, right? So people that you can actually, you know, put in your final and sort of start processing, and you can maybe squeeze some of those additional positive replies, right? Really, roughly 15% of them are positive replies, and then out of 15%, if you have 15% um, positive replies, if you have solid BDR or SDR team, you can generate around 10 appointments, right? So the, obviously there will be those appointments that you booked, but they, there were no shows, but then roughly speaking, 10 gonna be solid appointments. And then out of the 10 appointments, um, you can get, um, let's say one close sale, uh, you know, like because typical conversion from a closed, from the outbound sale into closed appointments is typically 10% uh, from the appointment into closed sale, it's typically 10%, right? So you are looking probably around um, one close sales with out of 10 appointments, right? And then um, 
so then, and then you can scale, right? You can kind of play around with those numbers. Your conversion could be different, but these are the expectations. So in a way, if you, when you go to the top, then you can say that a thousand emails should give me one close sale. And then I can obviously calculate how much money would it uh, May, would it take me to, you know, to generate leads uh, for those a thousand emails, right? And then create templates and create all the tools and so on and so forth to get that sale, right? But any increase into the number of replies or number of opens or number of positive would immediately generate uh, generate result on a closed sale end, right? So in a way, if you feel that hey, I'm not getting enough replies because my emails are not being delivered to clients' inboxes, or hey, I can generate much more positive replies if my emails are opened and my emails are not open because my bad sending reputation. So all these things would actually result into increasing more sale. So investing additional 50 bucks or 100 or $200 into that developability uh, side of the things would actually help to generate more deals, and if you are dealing with twenty-five, fifty, hundred thousand dollars deals, right, then it's a, a, a substantial ROI, right? So it should be no-brainer to to be interested in doing everything that you can to increase that open rate, reply rate uh, using this math. Okay. Once we know these numbers, right, what are the rules, or what should I keep in mind to to be able to maintain or achieve above 50% open rate and above 10 or more percent reply rate. Obviously, we all had campaigns that, you know, are generating 15, 20, 25% reply rate, but really, what does it take to at least average under 10% and, and be able to scale that across my SDR team, right? So there are 10 tips that uh, Dan and me prepared for you guys. So we're going to go one by one in a very detailed manner. All right. So first one, validate all prospects emails. So two things here. First, go in and, and check out all the previous webinars when uh, my my partner Vlad um, had, you know, some guests uh, that were talking with him about email availability and what are the rules and what are the nuances of the game. Right. And they've been talking a lot about the email reputation or deliverability reputation, right? And the important aspect of that reputation is the way your your inbox on the inbox that you're using for sending out emails is behaving across the board when they are sending out emails. So in a way, if you send out a hundred emails, right, and out of those a hundred emails, let's say. 10 emails bounce back and they bounce back because some of those email addresses doesn't uh, some of those email addresses don't exist then the spam filters on a on a google end or on the recipients end would analyze the performance and they would say hey if john sent 100 email and 10 bounce back then john didn't clean the list or so that's a generically generated list or the data is stolen whatever so it means that the reputation goes down so in a way by validating your prospects emails to understand whether they are bounced or valid or invalid uh, you will protect yourself from those additional security verification that go through when you send out emails so in a way um by definition uh, with a clean list, your reputation would be higher. Thus, the performance of the emails will be higher, right? Um, very often, people think that if I am purchasing um, a clean list, uh, for example, let's say I go to ZoomInfo, right? And I pay a lot to, uh, to generate the list or I use some other tools to generate the list, right? People think that because those companies sell leads then the leads are valid by definition and that's not actually true because uh, the way those uh, vendors pursue uh, perceive this they aggregate data in one place but then every lead or every email have a um, expiration date so typically when you think of leads then you know it's about 10, 20 to 30 percent quality goes down every three months so in a way when you get a, a, a hundred leads from zoom info you never know whether they validated these leads uh, yesterday or last week or last month even though they put the information that these leads 
had been verified very often we've seen the opposite so you you know it's like the quality of the or the life value of that list goes down every few months so in a way before sending even before sending out any emails even when you purchase a very clean list you would still need to verify the validity of all the leads uh, by utilizing some other tools like uh, zero bounds for example right uh, so please make sure that you do that. Uh, the same goes when you are dealing with your own list, right? So if you already have a CRM and you have a database in that CRM of your clients and you know that these are the clients that you organically collected over the years, still the same applies for them uh, when you're dealing with the quality of emails or, or quality of the data. So the 20 to 30% decrease also applies to, to to your leads so you still need to verify um all emails once again um obviously the reason for that uh low or that decrease in the in the value of of, of the leads is that you know people change jobs right people change their emails right uh, people um you know change their emails because they have been bombarded by spam emails whatever right but you got the point right so just make sure that those uh, you know emails uh, lists are, are are verified they are they are valid and you've done that right before the send out really this this the same day or the day before all right then the next point is reached out to the target audience to avoid spam flagging so again um, audience is very important right you cannot just email a, a generic list uh, that's actually why many people they approach companies like Belkins or other service providers that that do the the hand created database research right because uh with with a generic database like you can get access to uh, the same as your competitors right so in a way um, if I'm emailing the same list as my competitors and there are a lot of those competitors in my space then the chances that that lead can be converted by me is lower right um, so in a way by by generating a unique set of leads manually out of different open data sources and leveraging multiple tools i will be more successful than than my colleagues from other companies right and then also talking about the target audience very often when you think of launching some campaigns and doing some outreach we think that hey this is the right audience for me and i'm like just you know send a bulk campaign with a lot of those people without actually filtering them out or kind of you know like segmenting them in different sub audience or sub categories right when when i do this i stop from thinking about the next moves or next steps so in a way if i create dedicated campaigns for each title like ceo cfo coo or technical and executive titles right or different regions or uh different uh, let's say revenue uh, uh revenue uh, sizes right so in this way um i will have much more data later on to understand who answers my emails what are those people not the people that i think would make a call about purchasing my product but who would want to engage with me because this might be two different you know two different people right because for example we had a client that we work with and again just give you a story here right we had a client that we work with uh, they were in in retail business and they've uh we've been uh, so we've been uh, selling this um uh, on-shelf automation platform based on the AI that helps retailers to uh, to optimize their shelf space. Right, great product, great promising, and we've reached out to uh, to you know to head of e-commerce. We reached out to uh, you know to people that were in charge of working with the new tech and so on and so forth. And we had a very poor performance, very poor performance. People didn't want to answer our emails. They didn't want to attend calls. You know, very poor performance. So, you know, we, we've been brainstorming and looking at why, you know, why is that? And when we start launching these targeted audience campaigns, we've realized that those are not the right people to talk to. The right people were actually category managers and, and, and people on site that were really um that that really cared about that space because they worked with that space on a daily basis so we were sort of like 
pitching them and then they uh, they sort of like forwarded us to their their leader or team leader or whatever so we start setting up some calls and then when we were moving up the chain with all the conversation after called emailing we got to calls where those guys set up calls together with our colleagues who were those kind of key decision makers so in a way we've moved up to the chain through email marketing talking to um to those category managers to then uh, be able to talk to a, a budget holder but when we targeted the budget holder initially we um you know we didn't have success a lot of success and then because the the audience where it wasn't targeted for us um the, a lot of those um hypothetically right um icps right they marked our emails as spam they didn't engage with our email and because they didn't engage that also affected the um the deliverability rate right so by by not targeting the right audience you increase your spam flagging and you decrease your engagement that also um increase decrease the deliverability and increase the uh, the the potential spam flagging right so this these things are are all connected so really please be careful about the target audience then set up your dns records right um really um the, the the problem here is that you're not just using one tool right so the times where you just had a crm system um, had passed and now you have probably five ten different tools for all the things in your sales team so you know now you have sales um sales enablement teams right and because of all of those tools all of them have their own backend technical settings but then all are connected to your domain to your company name to your website and all of them have their own uh spf records uh, dickim demark you know and, and you name it all of those small things maybe ips maybe rdns whatever so whenever you have a lot of those tools talking you need to make sure that the the setup is correct in terms of the right dns records the right place the right order and if you miss one digit or if you miss anything then that's going to jeopardize the whole operation and that's going to affect a lot your your deliverability and honestly i think about 75 percent that um approach folderly team and they are on our platform they have problems with dns records something is off there so once our team analyzes what they have um their performance goes up just with with this small you know thing that you can correct on your end and then one of the questions on friday webinar was that how how do you know what are the right dns records how do, would you know how to set them up right um what i can kind of help you give you a hint is you can go to uh, help.folder.com it's our help center or you go to folder.com and you go to navigation menu and you click on help center and there are a lot of different very very useful articles about how to set up different dns records for you to look through uh, we also created our own spf generator uh, to help you to set up that spf record that most of the people have problem with so you can go to folder.com slash SPF generator um, and you will uh, be able just to put down your website, click on the tools that you use, click generate, and then um, uh, the page will automatically going to generate or our script actually on that page going to generate um, automatically the, S the correct SPF uh, record with the correct syntax for you so that you can copy and paste it in your in your console and sort of like save that and then you will see that it's, it's fine, right? And then... The next one moving on is creating engaging content and subject lines that matters, right? Um, this one is very important, obviously, because it affects the the, the durability, right? L less people engage with your content, less clicks you get, less replies you get, less opens you get, the lower your performance is. And the lower your performance is, obviously, the, the, uh, the, the lower your reputation for spam filter is because they really you know if if you're sending out emails without engagement it means that it's an outreach so they will kind of decrease your performance by definition right but also really it's about just being effective with the channel right you cannot just send generic email you cannot send just generic subject lines and uh so you need to personalize it you know you need to think of how people will will read through this how they will engage with this one of the my personal recommendation that I gave on Friday was 
whenever I send out anything, uh, whenever I send anything out, I, I will try or I try that it's not marketing at all. And it's even not salesy. It's more like a message from one business individual to another. And whenever I do that, I read these emails out loud. And if I read them out loud, then I can remove the parts that that, uh, that I cringe from, right? Because when you read out loud something very ballsy or statementy, then you would know that whenever someone else is going to read that, they would know that that's a, you know, that's just a, that's just an outreach email without, you know, any hard fashion or whatever. Um, and then also, you know, you don't send anything that you feel like pe people don't talk like this, right? So if, uh, you know, if you read it through and you know that this is like, a, you know, just you 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 took it from uh, from the magazine or something like it's just a piece of content or piece of text. Then that's not how people work. So typically, when you're dealing with email marketing or with email, it's about conversation. It's about the the message, and the message is like, "Hey, John, reach out to you about this and this and this," uh, or you know, like, "Hey, John, you, would you be the right person to discuss this?" or Hey, I was trying to reach out to Jesse. It wasn't successful. I I have your email address as well. Would you be interested in discussing this and this? Because I think that that's going to be helpful. Whatever, right? So the point here is that that's a conversation. How people construct sentences, right? So um, and very often, uh, marketing people and salespeople when they send follow ups or when they again salespeople paid attention to this, but really marketing people when they are creating um, emails, they um, you know, they skip this part. Um, and that's why I always say that the best campaigns are run by salespeople, not by marketing people. Uh, right. And then um, when you are doing the, you know, the outreach, uh, make sure that you have five to six follow ups per sequence, right? So you never send just a, a blast of emails because typically the engagements are after the third or fourth email right um and that's why you always learn and study like how many uh follow-ups i need per sequence to be able to get to the best of my performance so for example i might start with a sequence that consists of four steps or four waves right and then i track how people engage with 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 my email if i see that i don't have enough engagement i can have or i can add one or two more steps right if i see that the my negativity rate goes up so people start really marking my emails as spam or start being rude about my follow-ups right then what i do i cut that down to one or two emails and then i also see that right one of the examples that i gave uh, on on friday was um the campaign that my team did for when we were entering Indian market back in, I think, like 18 or 19, uh, we entered that market with our standard best practice of three to four waves uh, sequence. And we failed miserably. And the reason we failed was that for that local market, um, the sequence should have consisted of, um, you know, from 10 and more waves so that people after the eighth, ninth, and 10th wave start noticing and start replying so you need to be more you know more more you know more pushy in a way or you know just sequences need to be more substantial right uh, and then you wouldn't know that if you wouldn't learn from your sequence or track uh, the you know the stages you're going to have on that sequence okay so uh the next one uh you should make sure that you keep within your mailbox limits um, again, very often one of the first mistakes is you um, create a dedicated domain that you would use for your outreach. Uh, then you would set up several mailboxes uh, that you that you would dedicate to the outreach. And then from the first day or for the first few days, you start sending out a ton of emails. A ton of emails, I mean, like you start with 100, 200, 500, whatever. You know, many people does differently. But then the problem here is that you need to build up your sending reputation first and then you also depending on your email service provider you need to keep certain limits for example for for google's workspace or or gmail or g suite uh, the the number is under 200 a day and if you exceed that number that the chances that you would be marked as spam are much much higher and for you to get to this 200 you need to build up your reputation so the schedule might be 
you know, you start off by sending 10 email uh, first day or the second day once you set up the mailbox, right? Then you go up to 30 emails in the next like five, seven days. Then you go up to uh, increase it to by 20 every two, three days. So that in the, in, in the end, uh, during the span of, let's say, three weeks, you increase it to 200 and then you keep it at that level, right? And then when you do this, you always check your drivability. And um, typically for you to warm up your mailbox, uh, you need to, to have some kind of conversations or some engagements and the more engagements you have, the better. And very often we see that during that warm up process, many companies, they actually ruin their reputation. So that's why one of the features that my team put together or built in Falderly was the, the automated warm up process to increase your sending reputation. So in a way, um, you can just set up how many emails you would want to send uh, or you want to be able to send. And then uh, the platform gonna automatically build up the schedule for you, build it, build build up the, the email list uh, with our dedicated seats. And then um, we're gonna be doing the warm up on your behalf um, so while you can send some outreach campaigns at the same time, but because we're going to generate much more positive engagements on your behalf, any negative engagements that you're going to generate opposite to what we've been do we will be doing will uh, cancel out the negative effects with positive effects and you're going to have the, the warmer process will be much, much um, efficient for you. Okay. Uh, we already talked about the personalization. We really wanted to highlight this one as well because engagements and personalizations are the key to success. So you need to try to personalize it. However, when you think of personalization, don't send long emails. I mean, you know this yourself. Whenever you receive a, 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 a substantial lengthy email, even from your colleague, every time you're like, oh, okay, I need, I need time for that. I need coffee for this, right? So, um, so that's why I try to be short to the point. I typically say that the email should consist of the opening, um, you know, opening, then you have main body and then you have call to action. That's it. And then the main body and opening can be one sentence, main body can be two sentence, call to action, one, two sentence, and that's it. Always a B test to find the perfect copy. So, all the new tools that you might be using or you already are using have the A-B testing option. So you always A-B test. And um, obviously don't go too crazy on A-B testing, uh, but really testing subject lines, testing audiences, testing um, the, the length of the sequence is the way to go. Uh, the more you test, the better your understanding is of what is the perfect page for for my business. So make sure that you do the A-B testing. Uh, never use your personal emails, right? So anything like at Gmail, at Yahoo, at iCloud, don't use those. Obviously, it's illegal to use personal names. And then also people don't check their personal mails for business purposes that often. And then they will be marking your emails as spam. So you don't use the personal emails, only business emails, right? Um, and then and don't be afraid to mix in other channels to your outreach to drive the best results. Um, really, it's also very important not just to focus on one channel, but actually go on the channel, as I said a few minutes ago, and we've spoke about this heavily on Friday. Um, so the way to, to go is uh, you need to start investing into multiple channels, see which channel works better conversion-wise and budget-wise, and then continue investing into those that are more efficient while still continuing uh, maintaining and, and investing into the other channels that maybe are not that efficient right now, but they will be later on. Plus they would give you that, um, that sort of like uh, across the board effect where all of them are connected and all of them are working towards one, one result, which is generating leads, creating brand, you know, generating the right conversion. So always mix all other channels in play and be smart about this. So for some of the campaigns, you can actually actually build out the, the whole process where you start off by uh, by emailing and then you add LinkedIn and then you add calling and then you add retargeting or advertising and then you follow up with some content strategy and you kind of do this uh, nice nurturing campaign where all of these things are connected and they're working. All right, folks. So please make sure that all these 10 are being um, are, are being followed. Then moving on to the next slide here. Here is on the screen, you see the 
uh, one of the cases that uh, we've did, we've done with uh, director of data analysis and uh, and strategy for the marketing agency out of San Diego. Um, the reason I'm showing you this is um, all the case studies on the folder the website or on the Belkity website, they have the actionable tips and learnings and insights that we've learned from the comparison with this with those companies. So in a way, it's not just uh, let's say like a bullshit content that we promote the brand from. We really wanted people to be educated by those. So that's why uh, please go to belkinsio slash case studies or folderly.io slash slash case studies and um if you are interested in learning um on the mistakes of others and what was done to change those uh please take your time uh learn from those case studies and i'm sure that you will find some really th good things that um or some things that other people did that you are doing right now that you can just go ahead and change okay um, and then so um, obviously, if you have any questions whatsoever, please reply to this email. I will make sure that I will collect all the questions and then we'll prepare answers for all the questions. And um, and then uh, we'll send to everyone who was on the webinar. And um, so let's just get together to get to to uh, to. It's been a, a difficult day for me. Okay, so sorry about that. So let's just uh, put together a list of questions, and um, I'll get back to you with all the answers. And um, maybe the question that you're gonna ask, you know, help someone else. So please don't feel, uh, don't shy. Feel free um, to send out those questions. I'll be happy to answer all the, all of them. Um, I wanted to finish off by uh, introducing the the partner program that we've uh, started doing at Folderly. So it's a commission reward. Um, um, program where uh, if you guys are working with uh, direct clients and you feel like Folderly can be a good fit for them, um, you can go to a Folderly website, you can register in a partner account with us, and then you can go to your dashboard where uh, you can see your dedicated referral link and your coupon for 15% off for your clients, and then uh, you can also uh, go through the guide how to set up as well as get on the uh, call with our partner specialists who can introduce you to the program and answer all your questions. But once you go, go through all of that, essentially you send a link to your client, they register an account with Folderly, um, they get 15% off on, on, the, on the monthly subscription which is much better than what they get when they go retail and they buy from us. So that's obviously better to go through you. But then you also, as the partner, you get at least 15% off on a month-to-month -month basis on the ongoing customer lifetime value um, from that deal. So in a way, you can earn additional um, money that you can spend on other channels by just uh, really generate, creating a an account, sending the link, and you know, encouraging some of those clients. All right. So um, again, it's very easy. Um, you can go to forly.com. You can scroll on the website. You will see the affiliate partnership page, and there all the details are in there. All right. Um, okay, folks, that was it. So the two things that uh, you will learn from this first. Uh, the video will be available to you through this link, and we're gonna put it on YouTube. Uh, again, I apologize for not being able to record this on Friday. There was a, um, a hiccup on our end. And then um, also the QA will be done online. Uh, so please reply to the email with the recording or go to YouTube and put down your question in the comment section. And we're gonna collect all those questions in the next week or so. And we're gonna prepare a, a very detailed and lengthy answer will the support links and information to each and every question. And it will be sent to you by email so that you can uh, use that information to, to be better at emailing, to be better at sales and to be better at email availability. All right, folks, I appreciate that you've been with me today and I hope that uh, you enjoyed this um, uh, this second part or the the second try of the of the how to call uh, cold email in 2020 webinar. All right, um, I'll see you soon. I appreciate you folks, guys. Take care.